Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money Investing Show. This week we are grappling the topic of having a trading plan. You simply can't live without them. It doesn't matter how much experience you have or where you're at in your journey in markets. This is going to help you build what we call world-class basics, a foundation, a platform for consistent, overall, disciplined, non-emotional, and ultimately profitable trading. Take plenty of notes and as always, take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurentiel. Thank you for having me on the show, Mr. Baxter. I'm very excited about today's episode. One thing you know I love is planning. We're going to talk about, in particular, though, building a trading plan. What's actually included? Why do you have one? And when do you implement it? One of the most important things you do as a trader. And, uh, oh, gee whiz, I've seen some doozies over the years. Uh, I've had people, oh, it's in my head. Uh, I know what I'm doing. I've, I've done this long enough. I don't need a, a plan anymore. And all of the stories that sit in between. But uh, no question about it. Success leaves clues. And like any business, um, failing to plan is planning to fail. And trading is no different. You have to have a, very carefully spell this out, written, printed off, most importantly, adhered to trading plan. Almost like a contract between yourself that this is what you are planning to do, this is what you will do. That is a great way of putting it, a contract with yourself to specify the activities that you're going to take as opposed to what you think you might do in the heat of combat. In fact, we just got off a call with somebody um, that's detracted from their plan in the heat of combat. So it's so, so important uh, to make sure that you've got this really locked in, built in, and most importantly, that you've actually hate to use the cliche, but really bought into it. You believe it and it's what you're going to do as opposed to the lip service of, oh yeah, I've got a written plan and sometimes I might use it. Absolutely. And it's not just about the strategy that you're going to implement. I think importantly, you look at this from an emotional perspective. As you say, you're in the heat of combat, get pretty hot under the collar. So being able to refer back to something that you wrote mm. when you were cool in that blue brain, as we say, mm. can make the big differences. Hugely. And, you know, if you take a step out of the world of trading for a moment, yeah, these if you, if you think about uh, a, a business that's got a mission statement and a vision and values and so on, and, you know, I was always quite sketchy about this. I remember very early in my career, we had the big training day and here's the company's mission statement and visions and values. And you're just like, you want can I get back on the floor and make some money? And uh, it, you, you sort of dismiss it. But as time goes by, particularly someone that owns uh, my own business, is that you realize that the it's a cornerstone of what you do because it sets the tone of everything. Uh, it gives you a decision-making framework work to refer back to is it can is the decision you're making in your business consistent with your vision and values and your mission statement if it's not you don't make that decision it's it's so easy to have that point of reference so in many respects a trading plan is the same um you you have to have it and you have to spend the time building it it takes time but it's something that once you've built you can live off for a lifetime totally all in all it's about having that top-down approach and i think you've used this reference before it's that helicopter view Mm. so having the overarching view of what you're going to do in, out, and jury in before you even start doing it. Absolutely, and we'll talk about some of the timing aspects of that why beforehand as we get into it. So I guess in its broadest sense, you know, let's talk about someone who's got a blank sheet of paper in front of them, um, and let's help you write a trading plan right now, which Where I guess is, is trading 101. It's a skill deficiency that most people probably need some help with. So you know, let's start off, what capital are you working with? And, and there's always two amounts of capital. There's what you're working with today, and then there's what you're going to be working with, say, in a year or two's time, if your trading has gone exceptionally well, it's over-delivered on results, you're very confident in the process, what do you then have to work with? And those two numbers are really, really important because the idea of building a good trading plan is that you can scale it. Um, you know, it sounds really obvious, but you're just adding a zero. Um, but if you haven't put the work into building that plan, when you come to add a zero, it's not just on a piece of paper, it's a physical transaction where you go from a $10,000 trade to a $100,000 trade, or maybe a $10,000 trade to a $20,000 or a $50,000 trade. Psychologically, that can be quite a roadblock for people. And when I talk to clients, particularly in the coaching space, where they've hit that roadblock where scaling up, oh, look, I know I've got to go bigger, it's the right time, or, or going smaller for that matter, which, which can happen at times in your career too. Um, but you know, there's just something holding me back. And as soon as I'm having that conversation, I know that they haven't done the work on really investing and building into their trading plan because they don't have enough confidence in it to scale up from it. Okay, so Amy, drawing upon that, you've got an amount that you're working with. Mm. Let's just pick an arbitrary amount. Let's say it's 50 grand yep. for the purposes of today's episode. Is that next step then working out how you're actually going to carve that up in your portfolio? Exactly right. So, you know, you might say, look, I want to do, you know, 10 positions of five grand. I'd probably err away from that because, you know, time you take into transaction fees and things like that, you're probably better off having five positions of 10 grand. 
grand um, or, or, or six positions of eight grand, but you don't really want to go much smaller than that if you can avoid it. Um, so now you've got what's called your position sizing. Now, that can be a little bit challenging too in its own right because there are certain strategies and cash on demand or cover calls being one of ours you know, necessitates that you buy shares in packets of 100. So it might be a little bit more than the 10 grand. It might be 9,400. It might be 11 grand to buy the requisite amount of 100 shares. So in, in that respect, you've now got to have a little bit of wiggle room, which would suggest that you're de deviating from your plan. That's just the reality of that strategy. So you need to build it in that you're going to buy it to the nearest 100 shares, that dollar value. So gotcha. you can put a caveat in there to, to have a written rule to handle that. So let's go off the back of it. Five positions of $10,000. That now is your position sizing. Um, are they all the same types of positions? So for example, are they just all in shares? Or is there a component where you might buy an option or maybe a CFD? Uh, in addition to using just shares, you might have other assets, in which case, you know, are you going to buy 10 grand's worth of call options on a stock? Probably not. That's a big hit, yeah. Um, so it might be the $10,000 of face value, whatever the equivalent is of, of a call option to do that. So there are some diving a little bit deeper, uh, there are some nuances to this, but keeping it really simple, five positions of 10 grand, there's your overall thing. They're in stocks. Are they in the Aussie or US? They're the sorts of things to articulate within the plan right at the very start. So five positions, 10 grand, Australian blue chip shares. There we go. That's our, that's our hunting ground for this plan. All right. Well, drawing upon even that further, AB, got your plan of attack in terms of your allocation position sizing. The next step is to screen out what stocks you actually are going mm. to trade and what you want in there. So what's your best advice for those guys? Okay, so, so screening might be um, something you can do on a price basis, for example. So let's say you're trading... US stocks, something like Priceline Pharmacies, a couple of thousand dollars a share. So you have five positions of 10 grand, you're not going to be buying many shares in Priceline. So there may be certain types of shares by virtue of what their dollar cost per share is that are outside of your budget. So you might set yourself up with a screen where um, you, you trade stuff that ranges between, say, you know, five and $30 a share. That might be the, the watering hole that you're choosing to go to. So five positions of 10 grand. Next thing is a price screener. Uh, you trade stocks that are between five and 30 grand, uh, $30 per share. That's the next one. Um, the, the, the next portion of that might be based on um, volatility. So one of the things I actively encourage and we teach our clients extensively on is using volatility as a screen so that you're not um, trading shares that let's call them too spicy uh, for your appetite if you're a new investor. So there are certain stocks in the marketplace which can be incredibly volatile. So if we break this down to a really simple example, if you compare Fortescue Metals, uh, the iron ore miner in Australia, to BHP, the more diversified resources stock, um, Fortescue by its very nature is a far more volatile stock because it does one thing and it's iron ore. Very good when iron ore prices are going up, um, but not so good when iron ore prices are moving down. So it's a, a one trick pony. And as a consequence, its share price by definition is a little bit more volatile than that you'd see in BHP. So you might put a volatility screener in using what we call implied volatility to keep away from the hot dogs and, and keep it in that sort of green zone of a, a moderate amount of risk that's not gonna scare the bejesus out of you if you're new to this. It's funny you say this, I had Indian food last night. I know we use this analogy all the time with our clients. You know, my dad, mm -hmm. mild butter chicken man, myself, I like a pretty hot lamb mm -hmm. vindaloo and there's that spectrum where most people sit somewhere in between conservative to, to risky. So mm. my question to you, AB, is when you're just starting out building a trading plan, how do you really determine where you actually sit on that level of yeah. spiciness, so to speak? I think you want to start at the lowest level of spiciness uh, for the simple reason that you're not going to get an unpleasant shock uh, and, and get burnt literally in the marketplace. Um, the purpose for doing that, and I've done this with some yeah, pretty high-end, high net worth type customers in the past, um, is you'll get to the point where you're frustrated with what's going on there, which is that natural then progression to go, look, I can handle this. What more is there in terms of movement in price in the marketplace? But that's a natural graduation as opposed to just jumping in at the deep end and uh, boots and all and hoping that you're going to work it out. So it's always better to start at the lower IV end, the lower volatility end. And then as your frustration and competence level at that level grows, you can then move on to the next tier, the next tier until you get to a level that you're really comfortable operating uh, that, that suits you. Uh, no, no, I've also got a home for some of the Trinidadian scorpion chilies I'm growing on the farm at the moment, if you like. 
like it's spicy. Beautiful. Two million Scovilles is just pure pain. Um, it's uh, it's bad news, but we'll talk about that another time. That, but I mean, if you compare that to trading for a moment, you know, it's like somebody that's never traded and they're jumping in on something that's yeah you know, a really really volatile stock. It's all over the place. They'll find it very stressful. They won't enjoy the process of trading, uh, and so it'll put them off the journey. Versus if they start correctly uh, with a well structured plan, they're not going to have that. So so far we've talked about a price screen. Now we've talked about a volatility screen. I think the third one to add into there is is making sure that you don't have too much what we call concentration risk. So let's say um, there are four banks that you might be looking at and they might all meet your price and volatility screening requirements. But putting four banks in a fairly small portfolio is all your eggs in one basket, literally. Uh, and again, I know this sounds common sense, but making sure that you don't have too much exposure to any given sector. You want a bit in resources, a bit in banking, maybe a bit in retail or consumer, uh, a bit in IT. Uh, it starts to give you a little bit of spread as opposed to something that's too focused just on one sector. What about ESG screening, AB? That's becoming ever more popular in our client base. I actually had a question on this on Friday last week. Mm. Is there a way that you can screen if you're that kind of investor? Look, there is, and, and ESG, you know, environmental social governance type screening is something we've actually covered a couple of times. Did a great podcast with uh, with Shoes, uh, Jimmy the Shoe uh, from uh, from Russell Investment, James Harwood, who did a, a terrific interview with us on on the ESG portfolio he runs. He's looking after what seven eight billion dollars in the market with an ESG mandate. So it's really good to look through the lenses that Shoes uses, and um, I, it's an affectionate name. We we worked together like thirty years ago, so we've been. I'd be interested to know where that nickname came from. <laughs> You see, <laughs> over a coffee or a beer, so. <laughs> um, so, in in that respect, yes, an ESG um, focus may be quite relevant for you. So, if you do have uh, an environmental focus, focusing on a uh, or looking to invest in MacArthur Coal or a coal mining company, might be something from a it, it's unconscionable to you from your own perspective. You have Monsanto, the sort of stock you probably want to invest in uh, from an environment perspective. Maybe alcohol and tobacco might be something that that is screened out for you, and that's where things start to get tricky because you might go look. I never used to be able to invest in Woolworths because of their grog business with Dan Murphy's and all that. They spun out Endeavour and Dan Murphy's. So now technically is Woolworths a, a greener company, but you know, it's what the second, third largest tobacco vendor in Australia. Um, you know, if you've got a really staunch uh, ESG environmentally uh, sound focus, you might argue that because they sell meat and they're involved with meat production, it precludes it from being one of your investments. So it's up to you how vigorous a screen, you know, defense companies, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's up to you as to how vigorous screen, but it is becoming increasingly mainstream for investors to consider that. Totally. And I think the whole notion of a war in Ukraine with Russia and whatnot certainly spurred a lot of interest in that space throughout this mm. year. I guess the question now, AB, as we sort of lead on to, to the, end of, the, 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 the end part of this broadcast is when you're actually implementing the trading plan, mm. the most important parts is the entry, the durian, in terms of the management of it, and then the exit. So how yeah. do you actually formulate that in advance? Okay, so we've got to the stage now, 50 grand, five positions of 10, we've got four different screeners to help us be in the in the right place. How do you, how do you now decide which one? You know, have you got the chocolate wheel spinning in the background? <laughs> Hopefully not. So we'll try and build on something a bit more sophisticated. So over time, you know, we've built up a model um, which uh, is a triptych. It's got three levels to it. So we look at technical analysis, which is our charting. We look at fundamental analysis, which is the news flow uh, around the stock. And then we look at quants, which is the volatility, which we've already talked about as a screener. So using your charts to help you with your entry becomes very, very important. Timing ultimately is charting is the best thing to help you with your timing. You know, and it doesn't have to be that advanced in terms of what you do because you know, I'm a huge fan of world class basics, as you know, support and resistance, um, add your volume on there, maybe look at on balance volume. And if you can't make a decision based on that information, there's no trade there. You shouldn't need 27 indicators confirming the trade. In fact, that probably becomes a rabbit hole that you go down and never never really emerge from successfully. Totally. So having a fairly stripped chart where you've got you know your turning points based on support and resistance, looking for rising volume, strong price action, like a positive close on the day shows you that the buying pressure was in there and pushing prices higher, some of the things that might help confirm uh, a particular entry day using charts. Clearly, there's more to it than that, but just to give you some headlines, um, around some of the tools that you can use. They'll be the main ones. Support, resistance, volume, trend, positive close, on balance volume. Um, and that's probably enough for you to make a reasonably decent decision, I would have thought. Do you know what I'd like to ask our listeners out there listening to this right now? Comment below on this podcast. What are your key three indicators that you're using? 
It's it, it, that that would be really interesting. So make sure you do put those below, um, and we can talk more about those perhaps in a in a in a future episode. And I think you know my heritage, my background for trading from yeah. You know, if you look at the world of floor trading, particularly, um, and this was interesting. It's something that Nick Leeson actually validated when we interviewed him a few weeks ago, uh, and that was. And if you haven't listened to that interview, by the way, talking about trading plans, do it. Yeah, you know, how to how to lose one billion pounds and bankrupt the oldest bank in the UK uh, was Nick's claim to fame. Tough. Um, and 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 that points to a really important part of your trading plan. But one of the things he talks about with his trading now is it's just really about reading the tape. The the most, yeah. You know, if you go back to people like Jesse Livermore, which is you know, the, the, the boy wonder of markets um, who, who learned to read the tape when it literally was a ticker, not even charts, not even price action, but actually a ticker, um, was very, very successful as a trader. So reading that price action is key. And you can read that price action. You don't need a whole bunch of indicators to, to help you do that. So less is more. Uh, would be the message there. So, yeah, that's some technicals for you. In terms of fundamentals, you know, and this again is an area that you know people typically can go down um, a, a, a really deep mine shaft to try and get the answers to. Keep it really simple on here. And I look at news flow in particular. And yes, I'm an economist, so fundamentals are a huge part of you know what we do. We just had our investment committee meeting this morning, and you know a lot of that was orientated towards fundamentals. But you look at the news flow on a particular business, and if there are lots and lots of negative stories, not the same story that's been told 28 different news channels, but you know, lots of different negative stories over a period of time where, oh, it, you know, and, and Peloton would be a very good example of this, the, the fitness business. Um, you know, it's been a really sustained period of negative news flow. So after COVID, people went back to work, so they weren't necessarily training from home. Um, they let some staff go, their subscriber numbers dropped away. They're looking at their model, their CEO and founder have stepped down. So there are four or five different negative news flow stories around that company. And they're the sorts of things to look out for because each one of those on their own aren't great reading, but collectively they actually add up to a really insurmountable argument that it's a dog of a stock right now. Until you get, and, and then on the opposite side of the coin, when you find companies that have got that consistent positive news flow behind them, that's the sort of thing you really want to be looking for in terms of you know positive, enduring momentum in an investment. Um, so there are two forms of analysis. The quants, we use volatility as a screener, as we've explained earlier, to look at the spiciness of a stock to make sure that it suits where the client risk appetite sits. Put those three things together, and now you've got your data points from which you can then make a decision. Chart looks great. Fundamentals are supportive. It's within the right levels of IV. Um, we don't have too much of this type of stock in the portfolio, and it's within the price bands that we can trade. This is where you then hit the button and get into it. Pull the trigger. You're in. Mm. Next step, managing yeah. the trade. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, on that note, you know, all of that work's done before you get into the trade. And and, and equally and, and, and perhaps we should take a step back before you place your trade live in the market, having done your analysis and worked out where you're getting in, the next most important thing is, well, where am I getting out of this? And yes, you do have to get out. You know, that's where profits are banked, they're realized when you actually get out. But there are also a set of circumstances where to get out when things have gone wrong. So let's talk about the positive one first up. So let's say, um, you know, we've been looking at a stock with technicals, fundamentals line up. It's in the price range. We don't have to do much of it. It meets our, uh, everything that we like to look for in terms of news flow, the quants and all of that. It's a goer. So you say, oh, I'm going to buy this at $10.40, just off that $10 support level. And I'm going to put a profit target in. Look, the, the range goes from 10 to $12. So I'm going to take profit at $11.75. Not $12, even though I could make a little bit more, it may not quite get to that resistance level. So in my mind, I've got a profit target of $11.75, which, you know, let's face it, is, um, you know, is, is, is a nice 17.5% or thereabouts. Decent gain, profit. yeah. So we could, if you're working with stocks only, make this very automated and you could put in when you place your trade an order to take profit at that level. So it's done automatically for you. Now, that's a best case. And the reason why it's good to work on that before you get into the trade, once you're in and you get that greed gland uh, that as human beings we all have squeezed a little bit and you think, this is going really well, I'm gonna, my expectations are going to continue to move higher and higher, you can sometimes start to get a bit greedy. And in the expectation that you want to make more than the stock can deliver, more than its trading range has to offer, you miss out on taking a profit, it slides back down to your entry and then you're in the thing for another three or six months while it recovers. So, you know, working on that before you get in, before that emotion kicks in is key. And we'll talk more about that in just a few moments, I think. The other side of the coin is, well, that's all well and good. In at 1040, at 1175. But what happens if her analysis is wrong? 
or we've read the market incorrectly, or there's a big announcement about interest rates or some economic data, which, or the stock itself, it comes up with a profit downgrade and the share price drops. What do we do now? And that's where the third part of our exit strategy is our stop loss or our risk management. So if we're wrong, hard word to use, but if you're wrong, yeah, that first, cup's the cheap, first cut is the cheapest one. So we put in place something called a stop loss. And that's a level that you set before you get into the trade, where if it hits this level, I'm getting out. So in the case of the example we've used, we're looking to get in at 1040, out at 1175, or if our view is wrong and the share price tanks, if it hits 960, we're getting out of the trade. It's going to cost us 80 cents, which you may not be very happy about at the time, but if it drops to $5.60, it'll be the best decision you've ever made. And as I say, the first cut's always the cheapest. Get that stop loss in place. And now you've actually got a game plan. Your intention is to buy at 1040 and your goal to bank profit, get out at 1175. But should that not happen and the unfathomable happens and the price starts to drop, we're getting out at 960. And you can put all of those orders in the market pretty much simultaneously. Get your buy order done as soon as you're filled on the trade, as soon as you're in the position, put in your take profit and your stop loss as a good until cancelled order, which you can do on software platforms these days, and just let it do its thing. You don't have to watch it because it's either going to hit that or it's going to hit that. And that's what you need to do. But there's no emotion in it now. And this is the key thing with building the plan is to make sure that we replace any kind of emotional red brain decision making with really analytical blue brain blue brain level headed decision making. We're in there for these reasons. We're getting out there to take our profit, but if it all goes wrong, we're getting out there. That's it, no if buts or maybes. Whereas if you got into the trade and then while you're in it go, okay, what should we do now? The greed gland is gonna squeeze and, and you'll get, you, you probably won't have the discipline to take profit or worse yet, if the price starts going away from you, you're gonna have a conversation, oh, let's just wait another day and see what happens, or we'll give it a bit of time, it'll come good. We did our research and it was a brilliant business, it'll come good. Look, it's a long-term holding in my portfolio, I'll keep holding it until it recovers. We've heard so many stories um, like this, haven't we? Yeah, uh, and oh, now it's a tax loss problem I've got, I can sell it to realize my tax loss, and that's a good thing, uh, and years later, you're still in the same stock. If you don't believe me, have a look at AMP or Telstra, and there's a 25-year, 30 year plus of misery for investors and those where they've just held and held and held and held. So don't fall into that trap. If it's not worked, cut it early. There's no ego in this. It's just a dollars and cents business. It's just, we got it wrong. Time to get out, put your money to the next thing that's going to work. You'd rather be rich than be right. That's for sure. hundred percent. Ideally both. They're not, they're not the same thing. It's nice for the ego to have both, but you know, they're not the same thing. So what we've got there is the guts of a plan. We started with our asset allocation. Which market are we trading? How much money we've got to work with? What position sizes are we taking? And then within those position sizes, we started to work on an entry criteria based on uh, technical analysis to help with their timing, fundamentals to give us a reason why, quants to help us to make sure we're not in too volatile or, or, or spicy an era of the market. And then where are we gonna get out of this when we've entered into the trade? What's our exit strategy look like for profit? Or if the unfathomable happens, where we're getting out if it goes wrong? And that is a trading plan. Sounds really good, AB. Those those predefined levels before you get into the trade completely remove any fear or greed emotions, mm -hmm. which we know are what most investors struggle with. So as we finish off and cap off today's episode, are there any final tips and tricks that you'd say to anyone out there to mm -hmm. put into their trading plan? Look, this this is a pretty pretty skinny framework. Um, yeah, I could spend two days teaching you um, the every nuance of building a, a world-class trading plan. Uh, and, and that's quite a basic one. You know, you could add in, you know, okay, how often am I monitoring the position or do I ever move my stop loss higher and all of those sorts of things, which are valid parts of any kind of trading plan. But I think rather than dive down the, the level of finessing, let's get everybody out there that consumes this material getting a trading plan in play. You know, and something really obvious is going with the trend. So when you're doing your technical charts uh, and your technical analysis and you're looking at your charts, if it's in a downtrend, why are you buying it? It's in a downtrend, let it base out, let it start to grind higher. It's not about getting in at the absolute low, it's getting it at a safe point in time. So this sort of plan, having a trend that's supportive and, and, and basing and moving higher, hopefully is gonna stop people treading on the landmine of jumping into the market too early because things have sold off and they look cheap. Um, they're cheap for a reason, that's because no one wants to own them and they'll continue to be cheap until buying pressure comes in. That's why 
things like on balance volume as a technical indicator is a really good early warning tool that, okay, this is based out, money's starting to flow in, and now you can start prepping to enter. It's really simple stuff, but as I maintain, and you guys are sick of hearing me say it, world-class basics are the thing that differentiate people that are very successful, that people are scratching around and getting frustrated with. This is a very cl- a basic plan. It's not even world-class, but it's a very basic plan. Follow it. It's going to help you. Don't bother following it or say, it's all right, I've got all this in my head or I don't need to worry about a plan on past that. And all you're doing is bringing a level of chaos to your decision making that will make trading very, very stressful for you. And almost certainly on the back of being stressful will not be profitable. Sage advice, AB. Thank you very much. No doubt there is plenty of value in that episode there. No, our listeners will love that. Thank you. Anytime, Mitch. Absolute pleasure. There you have it, guys. I'd ask one thing, if you know someone that's involved with the stock market, share this podcast with them so they can see and learn the benefits of having a trading plan. You never know, it might just save them from some financial pain. Make sure you give us a review and a rating, and we'll look forward to hosting you next week.